All right, thank you very much for the um, invitation to speak here. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me here. Very happy to be here again. I'm sorry about a very long title. Uh, but today I want to talk about, talk about some new class of quantum dynamics in which you can solve um, the entanglement dynamics uh, exactly in, at times. And that's underpinned by this concept of generalized dual unitarity. And this is work that is done in collaboration with my grad student, um, Chuan Liu. And yes, so the, the, the outline of the talk is as such. I will first give you a motivation, set up the, the work, uh, like place it in a bigger context and explain to you um, why we're interested in understanding entanglement dynamics. Secondly, I'll explain the key concept behind the construction, which is that of generalized uh, space-time duality. You've heard some of that in Tomash's talk yesterday. Um, and then I'll present to you the model and the exact results that we can find. And lastly, I'll just have a very quick discussion about some apparently new non-chaotic, non-integrable, non-Clifford dynamics that deserves to be better characterized. Some open questions still. All right, so as everyone knows, the dynamics of isolated quantum many-body systems is a very ubiquitous question. Um, it underpins many physical phenomena, such as quantum thermalization. So this is a question of how a closed, isolated quantum many-body system undergoing unitary dynamics in which information is not lost can somehow relax to some equilibrium state where we know from equilibrium um, postulates that some information is lost. So there's some paradox that's going on here. Very relatedly, there's also the question of quantum information scrambling, um, specifically in the context of, say, the black hole information paradox. Suppose that I have a qubit, I throw it into a black hole. The black hole and the qubit evolve unitarily, quantum mechanically. No information should be lost, but yet somehow the information cannot be recovered from uh, the information that we threw in cannot be recovered. So, of, of course, now we know that the key aspect that underlies such physical phenomena is the generation of quantum entanglement. There's no real paradox. It's simply because of the fact that if you consider a small system, it rapidly becomes very heavily entangled with the rest of the system, and that makes information very uh, irretrievable, and, 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 and therefore understanding how quantum entanglement is generated is key to understanding things like thermalization times, information scrambling times, and that's why we're interested in it. So solvable models of entanglement dynamics are very important because they give us insights to the underlying processes. They're highly desirable, but they're quite rare. Um, so we've heard of a couple of talks in uh, Tomash's talk yesterday. So a um, couple of examples, I mean. So for one, there are integral systems, systems which exhibit extensive integrals of motions, like free fermions, better answer solvable systems. I just threw out some random plots. There are too many, too many uh, works out there. OK, so and of another example would be Clifford plus stabilizer dynamics. So that's if you prepare systems in um, stabilizer states and evolve them by Clifford gates, gates that preserve the Pauli group, then this kind of dynamics can also be efficiently uh, computed and at times analytically computed as well. One uh, example which has come to prominence in the past few years, recent few years, has been that of dual unitary circuits. Uh, led by heroically by uh, Tomash's group and a few others. So this is, a, is, is the idea that you might want to think about a, um, you know, a quantum evolution, like a quantum circuit, and impose certain structures under a space-time transformation. So to give you the key idea behind what the um, a dual unitary circuit is, and I guess I can go quickly because everyone should have heard of this, or I guess uh, maybe not, but <laughs> let me just explain it. So if you imagine that we have a quantum circuit of unitary gates, then unitarity just means that the gates, if you pair them up with their, their, their um, adjoint, U and U dagger, they, they um, become the identity, right? They, they multiply to become the identity. But you can also, also, and that gives rise to an arrow of time in which information is flowing from bottom to up this way. This is a time direction. But now if you impose upon the local gates a different condition where we connect them in a different fashion, we connect them sideways with their U and U dagger, and we say that this is also the identity, then this is also a unitary condition, but now on the sideways gate. So then we can say that the system has a second arrow of time. So there are two arrows of time in this uh, quantum evolution, and this is the key concept of space-time duality, and this yields a lot of um, interesting results, uh, allows us to do calculations. So I'll just very quickly flash through some of them. Um, for example, if you're interested in, say, two-point correlations, Right. Um, so say that two points here separated by some space and uh, separated by some space and time. Then what happens is that we can think of that there is a light cone uh, due to causality in which there are no correlations within this light cone. 
But because there's this dual structure, if you turn the circuit sideways, there's also a dual light cone, uh, a, a dual causal cone. So therefore, correlations can only really exist on this, um, exactly on the light cone, not within the light cone. So therefore, this yields a very efficient computation of two-point correlation functions, and that's why unitary circuits are analytically tractable. So besides that, I'm interested in entanglement. So the class of dual unitary circuits, okay, so the class of dual unitary circuits also admits um, entanglement dynamics, which are also efficiently and analytically computable. For example, if you're interested in a subsystem of a larger system, you might be interested in the nth Randy entropy. Then um, it turns out that uh, due to quite a few works that have been out there, if you prepare the system in some solvable initial states, then the entanglement growth can be computed to be exactly linear and in fact maximal uh, up to the constraints from locality. So, and then it reaches the, the, the maximum entropy and saturates there. So there's some nice an analytic formula for this. So these systems are, you know, can be thought of as maximally rapidly thermalizing quantum antibody systems. And so the key idea here, and I just want to explain to you why space-time space -time duality is again underlying such computation is that we can compute the reduced density matrix under a space-time rotation. Think of it as a sideways evolution, and it turns out that that leads to, uh, you can think of it as a quantum channel is acting on a sideways um, evolution, and this channel is a maximally depolarizing channel, and it gives rise to the maximally, maximally depolarized state or, or the maximally mixed state uh, over time. Okay, so all that was just review, okay? But the question I want to pose today is, what other solvable models of entanglement dynamics are there? So how can we hope to find more of them? So I would like to take the idea of space-time duality and generalize it, make it a bit small, more uh, bigger. So one way to do that is instead of having a single error of time, which is, um, which, is, which is present because simply because the circuit is unitary, we can think of having more errors of time, right? So this idea is not a new idea, has been around for a couple of years now. Uh, one idea is, for example, to use so-called tri-unitary gates as you build up the circuit. So these gates are such that if you contract them in three different directions, so here this tensor is just the tensor, the unitary, and its folded version, uh, complex conjugated, and this circle represents the, uh, the contraction of this tensor with its folded version. If you connect them in three different ways, this way, this way, and that way, then they all yield a unitary condition, and this is maybe what is known as a tri-unitary condition, and it was shown that you can compute, again, spatial temporal correlations analytically, and they vanish um, everywhere except on the light cone and also at um, the x equals to zero uh, position. Entanglement growth is only partially solvable uh, for this certain classes of initial states, okay? And another idea of generalized space-time duality that kept, has come to the forefront very recently over the past only about five months is to um, impose more structure on, on the ways that pairs of gates underlying the circuit are contracted in a sideways evolution. Um, so this is a bit harder to give a physical in interpretation, but they term this a second level dual unitary condition because instead of having just a single condition, a condition on a single gate where if you contract them sideways, they become the, an, an identity, you use two pairs of them and then they almost become the identity up to the, the previous gate. So this is what they call the second level dual unitar unitarity. Uh, nothing stopping you from going to um, higher levels and, and more general constructions. And it was shown again that the analytic computation of uh, spatial temporal correlations can be done efficiently. Entanglement on the other hand, um, at the point of you know, my work has, was not fully studied yet, though there were some very recent works you know, on entanglement membrane calculations that only came out in the recent. Okay, so I'm gonna use this concept of generalized space-time uh, space duality and construct a model in which we can solve the entanglement dynamics exactly in some, some scenarios. So the previous constructions relied on imposing conditions on the local gates, how they contracted. So I'm going to suggest a different game that we can play. Perhaps we can just play it by, um, play the game by tiling space-time with some basic building blocks. It's a very related and com but complementary approach. I'm not saying that one is better than the, than the other one, but it's just complementary. So the two basic building blocks are this. Let's just have one basic building block be the Hadamard gate, which is uh, this, uh, which I'm going to denote by a circle pictorially in a, in a, in a tensor network diagram. And then if you turn the, 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 the diagram sideways, or equivalently, if you think of reshaping this matrix, 
then that leads, gives rise to a control Z gate, which is the interaction gate that we want in our system. So here I, I've also stuck two legs out to make this a two qubit gate. So we're going to just play the game where imagine that we have a bunch of world lines and we just drop, you know, uh, depending on your choice, these two gates. So for example, I might think of dropping, say, a bunch of CZs here, a bunch of Hadamards here, and a bunch of more Hadamards here, and so on. And here I construct some circuit. Okay, but what, what happened, and furthermore, uh, once we have this, we can also decorate the, 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 the lattice at every vertex by some phase gate. Okay, what does it buy us? So this is a tensor network representation of dynamics by the space-time tiling of these local gates. I, I want to mention that this is not restricted to 1D, even though I join it only for 1 plus 1D, but it clearly emits a dual kind of interpretation of, a, of the construction. So you, you can imagine that instead of dropping the gates this way, you can imagine that it was dropped in a different fashion. Right? So the, the way I've drawn it now is just some random, random mess, which may not emit some structure, but we'll see how if you, if you drop them judiciously, we can get some additional uh, generalized space-time duality in these systems. So just to give an example, um, so if we drop the set of gates this way, suppose that you drop the control Zs uniformly, and say you add some phase and phases in the vert vertices, and then you drop the harder marks, and then you continue, continue, and continue. So what this is for the experts, um, you recognize this as nothing more than the self-dual kick Ising model. Uh, the reason is because the control Z gates can be thought of as just Ising Ising interactions up to actions of local local phase gates, and then the Hadamard gates is nothing more than just a transverse field with some particular strength. So all in all, if you interpret this circuit as generated by some Floquet Hamiltonian, it's nothing more than just the kick Ising model. And in fact, from this pictorial rep representation, it's very clear that this has a dual unitary. Uh, this is dual unitary. In fact, it has a self duality because this diagram looks the same if you turn it this way, if you, look, if you view it this way, or sideways. Um, I should mention that this can be massaged into the previous um, known classification of brickwork circuits of dual unitary gates. So that's why I'm not claiming that this is beyond that construction. But let's play a different game. And this is the model that we will study, and I'll show you how, um, what features it has. Um, I will drop gates in a different fashion. Let's drop them in an alternating fashion. So for the first time step, I drop them on odd bonds. Right? And then I also drop other marks here. I'm going to allow for different phases on these two vertices. And then on the even um, time steps, I drop bonds here. Okay? I drop uh, interaction gates here on the, on the even bonds. And I repeat this. Okay, so what this is physically is just the kick Ising model in which the interactions are simply alternating between the odd and even bonds, the odd and even sub lattices in time. Um, I've allowed for some dimerized gates, or you can think of that as a longitudinal field in the kick Ising model in which this phase is G0 and this is G1. But you can see that this is not dual unitary, and, but clearly it has a form of space-time duality just by looking at, by staring at the picture, right? I think the picture is even clearer if I massage this, this network and redraw it. So if you redraw it, you will recognize this as nothing but a hexagonal tiling of space-time. And so it's clear that this alternating kick Ising model, AKIM, has some nice properties. It, in fact, has global tri-unitarity. There are three arrows of time. If you view the circuit this way, the original way, this is unitary. But clearly, if you view it this way, it's also unitary, ignoring what happens at the boundaries, but deep in the bulk it is. And also this way, it is also unitary. Um, I want to mention that this, as far as I know, has no obvious um, interpretation as, as being constructed from underlying local triunitary gates. So I want to stress home the point that maybe space-time duality is, is like imposing conditions on local gates is enough to give you some uh, space-time duality on the global structure, but maybe there's more structure if you just consider the entire circuit by itself. And I also want to mention that if I can think of this as a brick work circuit in which this is my, 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 my brick, my local two, two local gate, and it turns out that this two local gate satisfies this second level during unitary condition that was um, uncovered only a few months ago. Uh, but I will not really use this condition. So these two are the interesting properties of this AKIM model. Okay, so now I'll, I'll explain how entanglement dynamics can be computed and analyzed in this system. I'll consider the state on A here to be arbitrary, but I'll imagine that the states on B to be prepared in some 
dimerized product state, so 5051, 5051, and I desire the entanglement entropy growth on the subsystem A. So a standard way, uh, which also Tom has introduced, is to, because, because if, you're, if you're interested in the, um, the evolution of the reduced density matrix, we are going to always encounter U and U dagger, the forward and backwards branches of evolution. So it's very convenient to fold them into a single tensor. So this amounts to placing the um, U, U tensor, U circuit this way, and then put the U, U star, the, the complex conjugated circuit behind it. And um, informing the, sorry, informing the reduced density matrix, we're gonna trace out the degrees of freedom on B. So what we see here is that there's a repeating structure in which we can define a transfer matrix in which everything to the right and everything to the left is just governed by the action of the transfer matrix. So this transfer, transfer matrix really encodes the action of the bath on the subsystem. So to, to reduce notation and to not strain your eyes, then we can just simply draw them in bold fashion. I'm just going to make the line slightly darker to denote this double tensors. And I'm gonna introduce this red tensor, red uh, cross to just denote trace out. It's just notation, so it's not too important at this stage. But the point here is that, okay, so we can now understand the influence of the rest of the system on a sub subsystem A as the application of a large transfer matrix. And since we are applying it to a high power, it behooves us to look at its um, spectrum, basically its decomposition and it turns out that there's one dominant left and right eigen, eigenvector, which are the so-called influence matrices. They encode the environment's effect on the system. Yeah, so I claim that the transfer matrix of this uh, system, the AKIM, emits a simple fixed point influence matrix. Basically, they're just products of temporal bell pairs. So you imagine that, so if I, if I look at the original transfer matrix, is this, but I'm saying that you can replace it in a large end limit simply by its leading eigenvectors. So the left and the right eigenvectors are actually the same, and they look like just um, products of bell pairs in the forward and backwards branches. They just pair up the forwards and backwards branches. And this is, um, th this you can understand as, as being, the bath being a perfect dephaser, Markovian dephaser, because there's no temporal correlation. Now I mean also that the, the um, states on B to satisfy this so-called solvable in the influence matrix conditions I will not really go through this um, diagrams, but basically I just want to say that there's a large family of such states that obey this. So it's not just like special initial states that obey this uh, influence matrix condition. Okay, so we come to our first result. The first result is, uh, well, okay, so before I come to the first result, I just want to show you pictorially very quickly how triunitarity or generalized unitarity allows us to perform this computation very simply. It's just a pictorial way of, of, of deriving this. So here we have this transfer matrix and the purported um, influence matrix, the fixed point. So if you look at, it, at it, we can remove one of the one of the legs, and then we look at, at this this diagram here. This is just a CZ gate, but now in this direction. So we can use unitarity in this direction to remove it. If you remove it, then this structure arises. Then we can remove the local gates here. And then once again, we find that there's another control Z gate and that, that gets removed because of triunitarity and so on and so forth. And over, as you iterate the process, you can simplify the structure until you simplify no more. And at the end of the day, you have to use the influence matrix conditions to say that this is um, equal to the, the um, bell state here. Okay, so this gives a pictorial sense of how you know, um, having additional space time or generalized space time duality allows us to do the computation very, very simply. It's just complete, complete just pictorial graphical calculus or uh, pictorial graphical analysis. So we come to our first result is that the, the state on A can be just understood as, at any time T, can be understood as, being, as arising from the application of some quantum channel T times. And this quantum channel has an interpretation of just entangling gates, the AKM, on the subsystem A, followed by some boundary defacing on this first and last, last spins. So this result is great because it tells us that despite us trying to solve a thermodynamically large problem, we've reduced the problem down into just a local problem. So the complexity of the problem has been reduced from, from solving an exponentially large in total system size into something that is only that of the small system size. I should note that this channel is also is unital, uh, as you can check. So which means that the, um, 
maximally make state is a unity eigenvector of the channel. So, um, but it may not be the only one, okay, as we will see. Okay, so now, now, now I'll, I'll explain how to compute entanglement dynamics from different initial states in A. As a preliminary analysis, we can look at the gap of the channel C. Because the, so the gap here is defined as one minus the maximum of the eigenvalues, which are not the eigenvalue um, of the identity matrix. Because the spectrum of this, this channel is within the unit disk. Right, so there's one eigenvalue at one, which is the, the, the identity matrix, but there, there might be some stuff inside and there might be some stuff on the boundaries. So we're defining the gap as one minus the maximum of the eigenvalue, which is not the identity matrix. And this, is, this will give us some hints as to which uh, parameter regimes are solvable or not. Okay, so what we see here is a plot of the gap, heat map of the gap. Um, for some system size, but this is representative of all system sizes as well. Um, so we, what we see here and, uh, is that along this, these lines, when G0 is 0 pi or 2 pi, and similarly G1 is 0 pi or 2 pi, then the gap is 1, which means to say that all eigenvalues, except for the identity 1, are exactly a 0. So this channel has a very special structure. This, this is a, that is, is Jordan block structure is very, very simple. Uh, conversely, if we look at this blue regions, then there's a zero gap, which means that there are additional eigen, um, eigenvectors living on the boundary of the circle. So you have additional steady states, you have additional conserved quantities in the system, and inside there's a non-unity finite gap. So this becomes a bit more model specific, right? Okay, so what can we say about this? Generically, what we can say that for any parameter regime, G0, G1, which are the phase gates, the fields in, the, in, in this problem, if we prepare the, system, the states A to yeah, solve the IM conditions, the influence matrix conditions also, even though we don't need them to have the influence matrix results, we can just compute that the um, Renyi entropies grow linearly to the slope of two, but this time is less than NA over four. Okay, I won't bore you with the calculation, but I just want to say that it's, it's a very simple result of saying, of looking at the circuit. If the time is shallow enough, the circuit breaks up into two disjoint regions, and then you can efficiently, or you can exactly compute that, and you find that this is just 2t. Now, beyond early times, what else can we say? So, um, if you stay away from the, these special lines, the ones that are here, here, and the special, special points, so we find that the, the system is going to have this early time exact linear slope, but past that is going to have an exponential approach to maximum entropy with the rate set by the model dependent gap. So that's pretty much all we can say about this. Uh, we tried really hard, but I don't think we can say anything more. So this, this class of systems is interesting because it's partially solvable for, for these points, um, but you can see that this exhibits the characteristic um, exponential um, approach to maximum entropy uh, of typical many-body systems different from doing unitary circuits. I want, I want to also mention that I, I'm not showing it here, but at these points away from the special lines and points, the, the model is chaotic in the um, spectral statistic sense captured by the spectral form factor. Okay, but if we move to um, the special lines here, so what we can show is that any state thermalizes in at least time t equals na, and this is nothing more than just a um, calculation in which we show that the channel, if you raise it to a high, power, high enough power, um, it stabilizes, it becomes the same channel, and the ident identity matrix is a unique unity eigenvector. So the proof it re relies on identifying some simplifying tensor network identities and using them to contract the diagram. Uh, I don't really want to go into details, it's probably incomprehensible if, we, if I go through every step. But the point is that we have this result. But also, if we, we can also find additional conditions that we can impose on A, which we call the solvable entanglement conditions. So once again, it's a diagrammatic way of writing it. Um, incomprehensible if you look at it. But basically, there's a large family of such states in which the entanglement can be proven exactly to be linear and then saturates at maximum entropy. So these states are the ones that exhibit exact linear growth with entanglement velocity one half, uh, VE v equals to one half. Okay. Now, 
more interesting is are the two points, are the points where the gap is zero. So let, let's concentrate on these diagonal points when um, G0 and G1 are pi over two, or multiples of it, uh, sorry, and, and plus uh, shifts of it. Then what happens is that the steady state is instead reached in an earlier time, this Na over two plus one. Once again, tensor network diagrammatics, you can find some um, contraction rules and you can prove this. But interestingly, we find that at these points, we have a model in which there's a super extensive set of conserved quantities. Uh, this just comes about just by analyzing the, the pictorial, the tensor network di diagram for the channel, late time channel. And we find that there are products of ZIs, Z, ZZs on odd bonds and XX on even bonds. Any products of them are all integrals of motion. And it turns out that there are two to the power of Na minus one such quantities. This is, it's a very peculiar system, right? So this means that um, there are multiple steady states to the system. So we can, once again, for the, these points, find um, solvable states with maximum en entanglement entropy growth. So there's a diagrammatic proof of this, but we can also prove that for some special states, they have exact linear growth up to some sub-maximal entropy. So then they saturate to some sub-maximal, uh, saturate to say, for example, ZZ saturates to NA over two um, entropy. So in this class of models, you can solve all the, for all this system, uh, for all these states. Okay, and there's a very complicated way of deriving this, which is just basic graphical manipulations. Okay, and when I have points away from these two regions, then it becomes yet more interesting because we find that the, um, the gap, the eigenvalues of the channel, there are plus one and minus one eigenvalues, which implies that now the system is actually os oscillatory. It doesn't actually settle down to a single steady state or any steady state for that, for that matter, or depending on the initial state. But generically, we find that the system oscillates between two fixed points, one of which is the steady state of the previous, previous case, the one in the previous slide, and the other one is related by the application of some Pauli string, um, but the entanglement dynamics is still identical as in the previous case. Okay, so all those are the details, but I just want to have a high level summary of what we see in this AKIM. Um, we see that in this model, generically, things look quantum chaotic. Then if we look, zoom in on these special lines, we can find states with exact linear entanglement growth to maximum entropy. And you find that there are super extensive integrals of motion within these blue regions. Some of them are oscillatory um, points of the system. They don't settle down, but they oscillate between two configurations. And this, the typical message is that the AKMM is very rich with varied phenomenology enabled by generalized space-time duality or generalized dual unitarity. Comparing entanglement growth and spectral form factor with time? Yes, uh, uh, not entanglement growth or, and spectral form factor, but I do have a plot on spectral form factor in the next two slides. No, not, not yet, but I, I'll, I'll show you. So perhaps you'll answer your question there. Yeah, right. So the key idea is that if you had used this concept of generalized space-time duality, then you can get more models, uh, which are interesting. You have all this phenomenology. One question that one can ask is, What's the relation of some of these points to other known, other analytically known model of entanglement dynamics? In particular, let's think about Clifford dynamics. So the, this system at this green star regions actually is a Clifford circuit because the phase gates are multiples of pi over two and then underlying the gates are also control Zs and Hadamard, so they are Clifford gates. And, um, but one thing we should remember is that I mentioned that there are a lot of solvable states. So Clifford needs to have stabilized the states in order for our entanglement to be efficiently computable. So there's already a hint that maybe this is not quite the same thing. But nevertheless, let's push this uh, question. How similar are they or how non-similar are they? So let's focus on this green lines and this whether or not the green stars are related to the green lines. There are some common features. For example, we find to the computation that all the Renyi entropies are the same, regardless of the Renyi index. So this is a result of uh, equivalently saying that the entanglement spectrum of your reduced density matrix is flat. In Clifford dynamics, you can also show, and people have shown, that the entanglement spectrum is flat. Every Renyi index is the same. So maybe one might ask, is this 
solvable line just inherited by the Clifford points. Okay, so to do that, we, we looked at something called the um, 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 stabilizer operator entanglement. So because we have flatness in the entanglement spectrum, you can, we can decompose the reduced density matrix into stabilizers, OI, and the OIs have, uh, have these properties where they mutually commute and they have equal number of eigenvalues plus one and minus one. And then as time progresses, you have some number of stabilizers that cut the Hilbert space into progressively um, smaller and smaller partitions. So if you have no stabilizers, that's a maximally mixed state, and you have n of them, then that's a unique um, uh, pure state. So this number changes over time. Now, I'm not going to impose that these stabilizers are poly strings, right? If they were, and if you undergo Clifford dynamics, then these poly strings would be, remain poly strings, and therefore stabilizers remain stabilizers. But let's just find them numerically, OIs. And I'm going to compute the uh, operator entanglement. So basically, it's just a factorizability of this stabilizer upon a bipartition into two regions, A and B. Um, we're asking the question, how, how, how factorizable are they? Can they be written as a single product of some operator on A and some operator on B? Or is, is there some entropy associated with the linear combination? So that's the meaning of the operator entanglement entropy. As I mentioned, under Clifford dynamics, no operator entanglement can be generated because poly strings go to poly strings. And therefore, if you try to do a cut, you always find that they're factorizable, right? Okay, so here's the plot. We focus on system parameter G0 being zero, so one of the lines, and we let G1 be arbitrary. That's the system parameter. We prepare the, the state in one of the solvable states with one parameter theta, so theta is here. So what we see here is that um, you have regions of zero operator entanglement, regions of high operator entanglement, and the, these points here are the Clifford lines, are Clifford points. So we see that in the course of our dynamics, even though our system has flat entanglement spectrum, the, the stabilizers that make up the reduced density matrix are quite complicated. They, they, they have operator entanglement. I, I, want to emphasize, I want to mention that, of course, when we write it in the stabilizer formalism, it's not unique, but basically, for any choice of stabilizers, this is, this is true. So we see that this dynamics is quite clearly not Clifford. And it's not Clifford in just some hidden rotated basis. And to um, bring home the point, so we also studied the spectral form factor. Okay, so here, um, this is just the um, ensemble average spectral form factor. And this red line, uh, red, red data, corresponds to taking the model over all possible G0s and G1s and then averaging them randomly. We find that the model, as expected, as I claimed, is chaotic in the sense that they obey the COE uh, predictions. Here's a fit to the COE line. But interestingly, if we we'll set G0 to be zero and allow G1 to be random, uh, and average over that, I, we find this very oscillatory behavior, not Poissonian, not Wigner Dyson. I'm not really sure what to make of this. So I think this, this is something maybe someone with more insight can tell me more about what's happening here. Apparently, is, I want to say it's some novel, non-chaotic, non-Clifford, non-integrable dynamics. So it needs better characterization. So just to make sure, um, all these spikes, they're comparable to the plateau of the spectral form factor and not larger than that. No, as you can see, the, there are two axes, right? The red one has the value 256, right? Mm -hmm. Which is, you right. know, agreeing with like, to the power of eight, right. but the blue one is like 4,000. So it's- uh, Okay, so each is a separate axis. Yeah, so the blue one's axis is on the right. left, and the red one's okay. axis is on the right. So then I guess it's basically- um, It looks like there's some free particles in the system. Yeah, it, it's basically like a quasi-periodic system in some sense. Yeah, so right. if, if we could understand why that is the case, why there are some particles um, in the system. Right, so I- I guess the Hilbert space dimension of this system, would that be, um, like, what, what's the Hilbert space dimension? Oh, so we the eight particle, eight spins here, so it's two to the power of 56, two, five, six, sorry. Okay. So two to the power of eight is two, five, six. Okay, and, um, okay, it looks like a high degree of quasi-periodicity potentially, so I, I'm not sure about interpreting this as spectral statistics in the conventional sense. Yeah, so. Indeed, if you have insights about this, I'd be happy. All right, so I think that's the end of my talk, and in fact, that's the summary and outlook, is that we have introduced some new classes of solvable entanglement dynamics, 
enabled by space time, generalized space time duality, exemplified by the AKM. And of course, some open questions would be, if we run with this idea, what, what other entanglement solvable models can we find? And how can we better characterize them besides the fact that we can, we can do computations in them? So thank you for your time. More questions here? So I can afford two questions, but the first one is brief. So uh, spectral form factor, you cannot do, I mean, you cannot do analytically, right? Uh, well, we haven't have tried. You, have you thought about it? I mean, we haven't tried, but I think you, you should be able to. I'm not yeah, sure. Maybe, yeah, I, I guess so, yeah. But it's, yeah. there could be difficulties, but um, we can discuss. Maybe. Right. But the, the, the other question is, I mean, okay, so this is one particular mo class of models that you introduced, right? right. I mean, but can you think of uh, do we, using other regular lattices, com like, uh, or even this, there was this very interesting paper by Peter Glaze on this shaded calculus and uh, uniform notation for the face and the gate models or vertex and case face models. Right. You could also think of generalizing that in the yes. other direction, right? I yes, mean, you that's take, right. Yeah. Have you thought about this? I mean, well, we, we are just beginning to think about this. So yeah, all those are definitely. Yeah. So you could, you could think of a face model with uh, polygons which are not squares, right. Uh, right. which would Makes provide right. Makes sense. Tri -unitary, poly unitary dynamics. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, about this uh, fact that it's not rotated Clifford. Uh, where you show the plot, so the, the yeah, if you can show Oops. it again. Anyway, my question was, yeah, uh, this one. So uh, uh, the value itself, does it scale with, uh, I don't know, subsystem size or? So the value of this, the, the size of this? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it depends on what time you are looking at, right? So I here, I've only looked at a very small system size. Mm -hmm. So it's going to thermalize any, you're going to have no stabilizers. Because by I was history. wondering whether it's perhaps some more advanced version of a stabilizer that it's not just like products of Pauli's, but some finite MPO or something like oh, that. Oh, yeah. Could I mean, that, that would be, yeah. So, which is why I say I want to better characterize this. But currently, it's just pure numerical okay. um, investigation for a short time stabilizer at time equals to two. Like, that, that was the earliest time we could find a non trivial um, stabilizer. Everything else. Was at t equals to one, it was still a rotated Pauli basis. And only at t equals to two, then you have this non rotated Pauli basis, entangled you know, operator. At t equals to three, you have no operators, at least for this system class, because you are now maximally entropy. And if I can, uh, another question about the gaps and this, those. Uh, yes. So the size, the, 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 the size of the space in which this uh, uh, channel acts, uh, does it scale with the subsystem? Sorry, the size of the what, sir? Of the, so it's a spectrum of some uh, uh, channel, quantum ah, channel, ah, yeah. right? Yes. So these gaps, do they scale with the uh, NA, the, the size of your? Yeah, this is a good question. Um, yeah, we didn't actually characterize this okay. because that will be setting the approach of the um, density matrix to the maximally mixed state, right? Then I can imagine that as NA becomes bigger, there are some operators which need longer times, and therefore the gap has to also change the system size. Yeah, perhaps we can discuss afterwards. Right, because that'd be yeah. great. Thank you. So when you were talking about these like um, super extensively many conserved quantities, like did you mean something different to what happens with just integrable systems? Yeah. So maybe correct me if I'm wrong. So in integ in normal integral systems, you also have super extensive. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I mean, or well, there's there's like extensively many um, like functionally independent um, conserved quantities, but there's like exponentially in the volume many linearly independent. Right. Um, like you can just take products of conserved quantities and they give you new conserved quantities. True, yeah, but the, the so I, I mean, I, I think the answer is probably quite um, straightforward if we discuss this, but basically I just want to say that the the bonds, sorry, the operators on the bonds, ZZ on the even and X has the odds, so, so they don't commute. And so, but any products of them are also conserved. So I'm not sure if that satisfies your... Conserved quantities, which are not like mutually commuting. They, they don't have to be mutually, they're, they're not mutually commuting. Okay. So the ZZs here, the XX, they're, they're individually they, they, they commute. Uh, sorry, individually they're conserved, but they don't commute. And then if you multiply them, they, they also con are conserved. So like Z, Y, X. Okay. Let us conclude this session by thanking all Thank the speakers. You.